Good evening, everybody. This is the Rattle Gym Broadcasting Network premiere podcast, normally brought to you by Jesse Starcher, Source Material. We're actually going live tonight. Uh, of course, I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. Yeah, normally, Jesse pre-records these, and he doll- dollies them all up, you know, puts in some fun music. There's usually a gag reel of me making some such reference to porn or whatever. Um, <laughs> things- or, or there's or there's like two hours of me and Robert suddenly branching off on a different conversations because Jesse's too polite to tell us to shut up. That too. Uh, But Jesse, of course, is still not able to record with us. So this is a live source material. I am joined by, from Honeysuckle Rose Creations, Alexis Haina. How do you do, madam? Glad to be back. You guys went a whole week without me. I was starting to feel ignored. Yes, but like it's, May is Alexis and Sean month. Like you guys are on almost everything. (laughs) So we're making up for it. I have to share it with him. Well, only because both of you are on a lot of shows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I actually I said that to somebody else, and they got a good they they got a pretty good laugh out of that. Um, they're like, ah, that's ironic. Anyway, <laughs> um, tonight we've dedicated an entire week, as we tend to do here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, to the His Dark Materials uh, franchise. Tonight we're going to be discussing the first, the graphic novel adaptation of the first novel uh, that was written by Philip Pullman. Uh, Originally it was called Northern Lights when it was published in 1995. Um, In North America it's known as the Golden Compass. There has been a feature length motion picture uh, that was based on it and on HBO under the umbrella title of His Dark Materials, the first season of which is pretty much the entire Northern Light slash Golden Compass storyline. Uh, so tonight, for your listening pleasure, we will be discussing the graphic novel adaptation of said piece. And I, I wanted to do this because we, you know, we, I just kind of took a shot in the dark with this. Uh, I knew that, and we'll talk more about the show tomorrow and uh, why we're talking about it and everything, but when we had decided, when we had committed to doing His Dark Materials from HBO, I said, you know, I wonder if there's any kind of comic books on this. And lo and behold, there's at least this one. This was actually published in three different graphic novels, and then there was a combined, uh, a combined publication of all three. So that's what we're going to talk about. And let me ask you, Alexis, again, we'll, we'll talk into, we'll talk a little bit more about what brought you to this franchise when we discuss the show. But uh, did you know that there was a graphic novel out there until I mentioned it to you? And what did you think uh, when I pitched it as an idea? I actually had no idea. I did read uh, the Northern Lights book years ago, actually. I also, I started reading... Uh, the second book, The Subtle Knife, but I never really got around to it. I have all three in one combined book. It's currently uh, collecting dust on my bookshelf. I should probably give it another try and read it again, especially since in this current day and age, what the hell else am I going to (laughs) do? Quarantine. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I love the game grumps. They're calling. They they, they don't want to call mention the quarantine or the pandemic because apparently you say that on YouTube too often and you get demonetized. So they call it the Backstreet Boys reunion tour. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. But no, um, I actually had no idea that it had been adapted to a graphic novel. So, but I was intrigued to take a look at this because, you know, we always discuss the adaptation when we do the TV shows or the movie, but I think it's important to look at this as an adaptation of an adaptation through another adaptation, because this came out uh, as a precursor to the HBO series, but after the uh, abomination that was the uh, Daniel Craig, Nicole Kidman movie. Yes, which we'll be doing an on trial on later this week. So this was published. Now, we, again, we're doing the entire complete edition here, three graphic novels, as I said before, 
Um, this was written by Stephanie Melchior Durand. She's the one that adapted it. Uh, the illustrator is Clement uh, Abrere. I think that's how you pronounce that. It was published September 5th, 2017 by Alfred A. a. Nomf Books for Young Readers. You know, I don't know how... I, I'm looking at Goodreads right now to get my demographic information on the book. And I'll tell you what, it's got pretty good ratings. It was a, it got four stars uh, for the Goodread users. It's got a lot of reviews on it. People, for the most part seem to enjoy this and we're going to dig into it momentarily having watched his dark materials on hbo um and just having a loose now affiliation on what on what this uh the the storyline is about uh this i mean this pretty much from what i can tell there didn't seem to be that much difference between this and the show as near as i can tell as far as plot lines go before we go any further, I probably should point out we're, we are going to be talking about his dark materials later this week. I am a few episodes away from finishing the mini series. I was supposed to do it last week, and I spent most of last week passed out on the couch with a minor stomach bug. Oh no! Yeah, um, no, just one, just one of those annoying little inconveniences, you know, no big deal. But I, I I'll, I'll have the show finish. I just wanted to say, and for the record, again, read the comic, read the novel. You don't have to worry about spoilers, but if you mention something in the series to talk about this, I may not have any clue what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I'm gonna we're gonna try desperately. This isn't comic strip. This is source material. I'm gonna try desperately not to reference the television show from this point forward. So I'm gonna concentrate on the comic book. But I'm glad you read the novel because this is where you're very useful to me. Because I because to watching the show and then reading the comic book actually was really helpful because there were a couple of points in the show I was a little lost. I'm like, I don't know what's happening here. And then I read the comic. There's a plot line of the comic that um, doesn't deal with one of the plot lines from the show. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but, for the, <coughs> like I said, for the most part, it, it I, I think the comic book does a fairly decent job of bringing out the finer points uh, of the plot line. And, and I think that's what I wanted to ask you first. From what you remember of the novel, and I know there are some changes, that's what I, the reviews that I read address that, that there are some changes in the comic book adaptation from the novel, but for the most part, it's beat to beat to beat. Uh, would you agree? What do you remember? It does seem to be pretty close to it, uh, including how much they probably should have just cut to like a narration box or actually expanded on the artwork because sweet jesus this comic book is exposition 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 these people don't shut up <laughs> it's a lot of dialogue not a lot of you know i'll tell you we've done some comics storylines in marvel and dc from the 70s and 80s and it they kind of drive me crazy because there's so much um can't remember what the, what the technical term for them is. Non dialogue boxes. The, I mean, like the Kevin Smith Daredevil. Ugh, that might as well have been a novel. I, I wanted to shoot myself by the time it was over. So I kind of like this. You know, I like the stuff that's a little bit more dialogue driven. That that's a personal thing. You see, I want to ask the the positive reviews. Were these coming from people who had previously read the novel or seen the movie? I, you see, that's the thing. Is that based on what you know of this uh, of the original source before going into this graphic novel I think will greatly influence your your final opinion on whether or not this is actually a good graphic novel. So I have no background knowledge of this. No I've never read the novels because books are for burning. Um I say, what I get for having a partner who lives in Florida. <laughs> now I, um, you know, I say that you know, and it's become an ongoing gag here. But for the for the reality is, I stopped reading fiction a long time ago, uh, and I've just when I was reading <clears throat> nonfiction books. Uh, sorry, when I was reading books, I was just strictly reading nonfiction. And from all over the map. So I, I haven't really... So a lot of the people I podcast with, you, Winfrey, several others, when you know when you read, guys read, you tend to read a lot of fiction, especially of the fantasy genre. 
I don't think the last time I read... <clears throat> I think the last time I read a fantasy book was the Dragonland series, and that was when I was in college. Fair enough. <laughs> Which was 94 through 98. Um, so that being said, maybe some of the Star Wars books. So, uh, yeah, th I think a lot... To, to answer your question more directly, I think a lot of the people reading this are kind of like me. They watched the HBO show and then somehow came upon the graphic novel, and I think that might be where a lot of the high marks are coming from. Yeah, because I'm just going to say and get it out of the way. As someone whose first introduction to this was the novel, was the book before the graphic novel, I was not a fan of this graphic novel. And okay. I'm going to be repeating... God, I, just to make sure we're talking about the right thing, I am going to be repeating the same words over and over again and probably sounding like Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man. So, t so let's, let's dig into this. Um, I mean, the basic plot line of this is we have an orphan child who's being raised on a college campus and uh, she has an uncle who's an explorer and a scientist. Uh, we have religious organizations that he's running afoul of. Uh, and then we have a... Uh, our villains of sorts are the gobblers who are kidnapping children for strange and nefarious purposes. Isn't that right, Eddie? That's Toby. <laughs> Isn't that right, dog? Yeah, it's all right. I'll call... <laughs> Eddie, don't you dare join in. This is not a forest, damn it. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment, folks, while I change locations. So, um, moving forward. So, you, uh, part of uh, what happens is she is sent to go live with uh, some high society person, Miss Coulter. She kind of takes her on as an assistant, slash um, she becomes a mentor to her. Uh, at the same time, her friend and other children are kidnapped, and uh, our lead here, whose name is Lyra, uh, goes off in search of her friend, who has been kidnapped by the gob gobblers. Uh, she runs into the Egyptians, and it's the Egyptian children who have been taken. I'm really blasting through this. Uh, they travel north by northwest. Where uh, they take on local cowboy, what's his name? Lee Scoresby, I think his name is. That the yeah. Right? Lee Scoresby. But they also, uh, this is where we get a lot of talk of the armored bears. Um, there's one bear that has uh, gone into exile. He's a drunk and he's sort of living as an indentured servant in this fishing village. Well, um, through the use of the golden compass that she received uh, as a parting gift from the college. She's able to figure out where his armor is. Uh, she helps him get it back. He then, like a Wookiee, owes her a life debt. So um, they, uh, the, the Egyptians, the Ahmed Bear, the Cowboy, they all travel, continue to travel north where they find, uh, they find where, the go where the gobblers have taken the children. And the gobblers are actually this religious institution that Coulter belonged to. And they are trying to... Uh, this is all about dust, uh, as we find out from the beginning with her uncle, who turns out to be her father, says, uh, you know, it's uh, some importance. We can go back and talk about the specific specifics of this, but this is all about dust. And this one group wants to separate uh, children from, is it pronounced demons or demons? It, in the shows and everything, they pronounce it demons. But I have absolutely no idea why they write it the way they do. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, every kid, or adult, whatever, human, um, their soul is shared by a, uh, a familiar, as it were, if you're into that sort of thing. Same concept. Um, but the Gobblers, this religious institution, they want to separate the children from their demons in order to rid them of the dust... Uh, what is what's going on? Lyra leads a, a jailbreak, and the children are set free, and the and them and the Egyptians go home. But she's going to go find her father, which she does because he's still even further north. He is actually uh, living amongst the bears. <laughs> Along the way, she gets the armored bear 
who she's uh, befriended to take back his rightful kingdom. She she goes to free her dad. Her dad is uh, nonplussed, to say the least, to see her, but takes advantage of the opportunity to use her friend to power his experiment, which is if you if you separate the child from the demon, uh, the recurring phenomena will open a doorway to parallel universes. Um, he go he he does he goes through the doorway. Lyra goes through the doorway too, but uh, her purpose is to stop her father Azriel from doing nefarious deeds and destroy dust wherever she finds it. I believe a like pretty much pretty much get all the details there the in a in a very broad way. More or less. Now the question here is again you haven't read the novel, but are you familiar with the controversy that occurred when these books were published? Um I, I know they because of their religious connotations uh irritated some people, but if you were asking me for the specific incidents and no, I don't know what they are. Okay, Philip Pullman um really has an agenda not against religion so much as against the establishment of the church. Uh, and it's the, the more you read into these other books, the much more obvious it becomes. Mm-hmm. The idea behind this is that the magistrate and the gobblers are working for what is essentially the, the church, the Christian church. The idea is that the dust represents original sin. The attempt to separate the children from their souls is a way to prevent sin on them from growing up. And the idea of Lord Azrael finding another world out there to travel to, they consider heresy because it disproves the theory that there is only our world and the afterlife is created by uh, God. Which which definitely has its roots in historical uh, religious teachings, you know, in that we will only lim- we will limit the distribution of Bibles because we don't want people to dispute our teachings and challenge our leadership, that sort of thing. You know, that the, there's always been throughout history the idea of, you know, if you have a religious institution that also is a political institution and has some sort of leadership, they're wanting to make sure you know people don't know too much, lest they question the leadership and overthrow it. So I can see. And, and I'm not, and I don't have an agenda here. I'm not, I'm not about to start getting into my personal beliefs. But I can see the argument that the author is going for. Yeah, this is why the film that had Nicole Kidman and Daniel Craig bombed so badly was because to pl- make sure that they didn't stir up more controversy, they eliminated pretty much any reference to God and religion and the and original sin and all that. Which, when you realize you cut all that out, you are left with a very hollow story and some pretty generic special effects. Yeah, I think um, unlike the Chronicles of Narnia, which from what I understand kind of lean into Christian mythology, at least as near as I've been told, um, from what I've heard, the reviews of the Golden Compass movie were this is kind of shit fantasy when you remove the religious aspect. Yeah, Chronicles of Narnia is, in my opinion, a good enough book series that if you do remove the, you know, you can read it and not pick up on the Christian mythos that much. Mm-hmm. You know, if you know it's it, if you know about it going in, you read it. Yeah, you see, it's pretty obvious. But there's a reason this book is enjoyed by so many younger children. I mean, I had to read the first uh, line. The, I had to read the line, "The Witch in the Wardrobe," like. God, I don't know how many times <laughs> when I was a kid for school. It was ridiculous. So, but it's innocent enough that you don't notice it if you're not looking for it. You know, getting uh, back to the Golden Compass, in terms of this being a YA, um, and let's just talk about the graphic novel, um, in terms of it being like a YA graphic novel, you know, something that I could hand to my daughter, I... I <laughs> In the sense that you have this whole thing sort of rests on the shoulders of Lyra, and if you can sort of project yourself onto her as a reader, I can see the attraction. But outside of that, I'm not sure what there is for, you know, a junior high kid, I guess, to really be that interested. Like, there's some heady 
some fairly heady stuff here. Like when I was watching the show, I was like, I this can't be for anybody less than you know an adult. First of all, there's not that much action in it. Um, and other than the kid's pretty precocious, you know, and she kind of you know gives it to the adults here and there. Um, I don't know what the appeal of, to to a child is for this book. <laughs> not 100% certain either. I also felt the graphic novel really glossed over a lot of the elements of it. The book actually does do a little bit more setup in the earlier parts about what the demons are. Essentially, they are, in this world, a human's soul manifests outside their body as an animal. Mm -hmm. And when they become adult, when they reach adulthood, these animals will constantly change shape. When they reach adulthood, the animal... um, picks a form and stays so it kind of actually calls back I think a little bit to uh, like a Native American imagery of totems Mm -hmm. you know and I'm sure there have been many other religions around the world that have uh, had that exact same concept that's just the first one that comes to my head Makes sense. Yeah, and like so, the book actually does give a little bit more backstory on this. You open up the graphic novel and you're like, oh, look, there's our main character and she's got what looks like a weasel. Oh, no, it's a butterfly. Oh, no, it's a bird. Oh, no, it's a... What the hell is that? <laughs> right. Because you know, Lyra's uh, demon, Pan, does frequently change uh, his form throughout the book. Uh, the It's not a weasel. There's a specific name for it. Because with an E... And I suck at zoology, apparently, because I can't think of exactly what it's called. Yeah, Hang dude. on. Look Hang like, on. Look like, a ferret. look like a ferret to me. Yeah, but it's something else specifically. Let's see here. Um, while you're looking. Yeah. Uh, so, one of the things, you know, obviously... Ermine. Okay. And ermine. It's a, a stoat. It's a stoat. Ermine is um, n- not... Is the... Uh, well, it's another name for it. Okay. There you go. So, um, just so that we the, co- cover the various elements of, of a graphic novel, uh, <clears throat> what did you think of the adaptation of the general plot? Uh, I mean, you obviously, to one degree or another, liked the novel. So, um, so you so you're rereading it here, but it's in comic form. So, it, you know, it's, it's kind of silly, but like, like, well, I liked the book, but I hated the graphic novel. You know, there it's kind of one and the same. Um, but what did? But I do want to get your opinion on it. What did you think of the way they adapted the plot? It was boring. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Can I have a moment to get on my soapbox about this? By all means. Okay. Every graphic novel we review on this show, you can feel a passion, an idea, an idea behind it of why it was made. Even the worst graphic novels we've read, we you, you kind of get the feeling of what the artist and what the writer what really wanted to do. They had a vision. Yeah. Even if that vision was stupid, even if the jokes were really bad, it's like, well, yeah, they probably thought this was funny at one point or another. This graphic novel, it feels like homework. <laughs> it feels like some. It feels like the teach. It feels like a teacher said, "You need to make a new version of this book," and someone said, "Okay, I'll make a graphic novel," and then just did the most basic drawings and the most basic writing possible. Okay. There's not a lot of liberty taken with the artwork, and at least not until the very end where you get to the scenes where um, uh, Lord Azrael is trying to open up the barrier to the other world. Nearly every page is just very basic squares and rectangles. There's not a lot, you don't see a lot of really great artwork. There's no, I mean, I'm not calling for like a million splash pages or anything. Obviously, that can get super extremely overdone but there's no effort in this everything is very by the book basic okay we'll do this we'll do this do this I was hoping for a couple of pages where it was just okay 
clearly the artist wanted to have some fun with this or maybe there was a different kind of transition or maybe just you know the whole page was taken you know yeah maybe we had a whole page for an action scene you you have the bit where Lyra's trying to get the attention of um drunken polar bear with a Norvaldic name that I can't pronounce <laughs> And he turns around and roars at her. And I'm thinking, how much better would it have been if they'd ended? It's like, well, I don't think he notices me. And then you turn the page. And there's a whole page of him roaring in her face. How Lorik great would that have been? Bernin- Lorik Bernison. Yeah, Yorick, him. And I just, I was just wanting so much more out of this book. You know, a graphic novel, you really get to have fun with the interpretations of how the story should look. And you get to really play with the artwork and have a lot of fun with it. And these guys did not want to put in the effort for that. Hell, I even felt like they didn't put a lot of effort in for the pacing. A lot of graphic novels, they actually do work hard so that the end, the bottom of the page makes you want to turn the page to see. They, they do time the panels. They didn't time the panels on this. <laughs> I, I, I'm probably, you know, massacring the actual language of a real comic artist, but I think you know what I'm talking about. No, I'm with you. Here, here's where I agree with you. Um, I didn't hate it, number one. Like I said, I, I felt like it filled in some of the gaps that I wasn't getting from the TV series. Um, and I certainly had, don't have the novel to compare it to. The art... Here's where I agree with you. The artwork is kind of plain. Um... You know, fantasy is attractive for, I think, for most people because it really does take you to another place. And I don't know if it's the fault of the series itself that it's in an alternate London. And it... <laughs> it doesn't... The comic... Uh, sticking with the graphic novel for just a second, I don't get a, get a real sense of where this is. Um, a lot of the panels are sort of close-ups of Lyra, Lyra interacting with somebody... Um, when she encounters Yorick, um, you don't really get a sen- sense of the village that he's in or his turmoil. You're, you're, you're absolutely right in the fact that there's a lot of this that, you know, even though it took me a bit to get through it this morning, I think it took me around an hour or two to, uh, to, re- to read the whole thing. And that includes the moments where my daughter had to stop me and have her help, her, have me help her with her schoolwork. <laughs> um, but... It did feel like there were opportunities to flesh some things out. You get no concept of who Scoresby is, which is funny because I because I because again I don't want to talk about the TV show, but they spe- you spend a lot of time with that character on, on the show, and you and and I do feel like they spent almost an entire episode dealing with the polar bear, and you don't really get that in the comic. It seems to just sort of you know it hits the high points and then it keeps going. So. You don't really get a sense of what, how the bear fell from grace, um, or the, the kind of tortured life he's living in this village. You have no sense of who the cowboy is. You don't really. You get a sense of who Azriel is, but not until the end of the story, where he's an absolute bag of dicks. To, yeah. <laughs> to Lyra, um, the show I think did a better job of giving Coulter a degree of menace. Uh, that you don't really get in the graphic novel. Um, like, in the show, you can see why Lyra took off. In, in this, I know she does take off, and I know it's because, you know, and I know it's because she wants to know what happened to Roger. But even in, even in the graphic novel, now that I think about it, there were scant amount of pages dedicated to their relationship. So, when she, the fact that or the fact that she was desperately trying to find him and she was sort of preoccupied with that the whole time she was with Miss Coulter. None of that appears to be in the graphic novel. Not to mention, with a graphic novel, you really get, you, you always hear the phrase show, don't tell. And in a graphic novel, you get to have a lot of fun that you can do a show and a tell at the same time. They just... This has got to be the first crappy novel I've ever read where they just said, well, you know what, let's still just tell, not show. <laughs> you have this long series where we're talking to a witch named Serafina Pecala, Pecala, I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, and you find out her backstory with one of the Egyptian leaders. 
which is a great storyline. And you think they could have really done some great work with the artwork while she's telling the story, maybe shown uh, like a flashback again with a narration bubble over while she's telling this. We get to see them together and their child. But you just have Serafina sitting on her broomstick. Right. Or not broomstick, but branch of pine needles. I don't know what they're flying on. <laughs> um, but that actually brings up another point where uh, when they're, you know, after they've had the jailbreak at the Gobbler Lab, um, you know, and she's in the balloon with Scoresby, the polar bear, and Roger, and they're attacked by the, the, the ghast or something like that, they're called. Um, you know, they look like like ghosts basically like, like de- you know flying demons um, yeah I'm trying to see if it referenced it in the Wikipedia page but um when they're attacked by you know by the black ghost things it's like a page or it's you know a panel or two and <laughs> I, I hate that I keep doing this but when she falls out of the balloon I remember watching that and like telling my wife, like, I, I need to go to bed, but I have to watch what happens next because she just fell out of a fucking balloon, you know, high up in the sky. How does she survive this? You don't get any of that in the book, in the graphic novel. No. You know, it seems like the balloon was barely off the ground and she just fell on her tush, you know, <laughs> into some snow. Like, well, oopsie. Like, there's no, again, there's no tension. There's no real menace. Um not a lot of time dedicated to it and and maybe that's because of the format because of, you know I'm looking I'm reading a digital copy of the entire three graphic novel series um so in the paper edition in its original form so you know of three separate graphic novels they might not just have room to really delve into some of the stuff that we're talking about but <clears throat> You know, it's like, well, you've only got three graphic novels to work with here, and they're only X amount of pages long, so pick, you know, pick your babies, because the rest you're going to have to leave out of the book. Um, so, I mean, it might not even, it might just be the limitations that, that of, of, of adapting a thing to a different medium, but yeah, they really, this is like the Cliff Notes version. Exactly. You know what it reminded me of? You've seen the movie Major League, right? Sure have. You know the scene where, uh, oh god, what's the name? Of the, the guy who plays the catcher. He's pretty much like the main one of the main characters. Yes. Um, okay, you know he's trying to impress his former girlfriend by reading more because she's decided to become a librarian instead of a professional athlete. Yes. But he's reading comic book versions of the stories. Right. That's what this kind of reminded me of. Was, I, felt, I was reading this going, so is this just made for people who didn't want to read the whole book? Yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that, that, that's a valid point. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of the, if you don't want to say it's the graphic novel adaptation, it's the gist of the story. It's the gist of the novels. Um uh, that that Philip Pullman wrote, which you know, I don't want to judge it too harshly based on that. I mean, I get, I, I suppose there's, you know, I think about like Lock and Key. I actually just re, just listened to recently my, myself and Robert talking about the television show, and prior to that, I heard your guys' discussion on source material. You mean besides the uh, two hours that Jesse had to edit out? <laughs> yes, the the not the not not the what got cut part. Um, but, you know, when I heard you guys talking about the books, first of all, those, I mean, <clears throat> we're talking that series is like eight or nine graphic novels long. There's a lot of material to get into, and the show only adapts one or two of them. You know, saving room for future, uh, for future seri- um, seasons later on. And... I don't know, like, I think when you're sitting down to do a comic book version of something like, you know, like a, a novel, there's only so much you can get onto a page. And I suppose you can use creative license and do some interesting things with it, as opposed to just sort of a flat, you know, let's just hit the major beats. Um, 
and I think maybe that that might be my only criticism of it is instead of, it, you know they had a blank canvas to kind of work with they could have done anything they wanted with the source material and they were like eh let's just hit the major beats which serves its purpose but it's not particularly interesting exactly a graphic novel is a really interesting use of an adaptation because you're really not constrained by budgetary reasons. You know, it's like, I have this great idea for this vision. Well, we can't shoot that. We don't have the money. You can still do some really fun stuff with it because all because you're drawing it. And I really wanted to see that in this book. Mm-hmm. Well, look and, at look at like Jaws. You know, obviously, you know, you're talking about the 70s here when they shot mm-hmm. Jaws, which is also based on a novel from what I understand. Um, <clears throat> they got around lack of a budget for crazy killer killer shark by using tension and only showing you bits and pieces of the shark at a time, and it's considered oh, to be jo- like Jaws a classic. Is my, Jaws is my go-to example of what to do when you're when a project isn't working out the way you want. Right, because Jaws is because I I always go to that because Jaws is the movie where everything went wrong on paper, but because of that you ended up with one of the greatest scary movies of all time. Right. So I think you have to, you know, when faced with limitations, some people are going to, you know, are going to be overwhelmed by it and the project's not going to work out nearly as well as they'd hoped. And some people are going to take those limitations and turn it into something special. <laughs> you know, really, really work outside the box. Um, so I think all in all, uh, the graphic novel, I mean, I don't, I didn't dislike it as it seemed, uh, seemingly as much as you did. Um a but little... again, I read the novel. You're going off of the of the TV series, right. so we have very different, you know, approaches to when we pick this book up. And that's one of the things I was really hoping to explore on tonight's show, because we read the same book, but we are coming from completely different backstories here, backgrounds here. What? So that does bring up the question: How do you think they could have improved upon this? What could have been done differently? to really make this a special read and not just the Cliff Notes version of the book. Again, I would have loved to have seen them play around with the artwork and really build it up. For example, Mm -hmm. you got the page where Lyra meets Mrs. Coulter, who is, you know, the be-all, end-all villain of the book. You know, not counting, you know, the church. Okay. It's a single panel where she bows to her. I would have done a whole page of her walking up to Lyra and just showing her in her dress, just standing there, to show how important she is. Again, maybe a whole page to <laughs> Yorick roaring at Lyra. We could have done so much more with the artwork to build up the suspension, to point to the importance of character, to you know get a better understanding of the emotional weight that Lyra and all these other characters are going through. Does Lyra come across like an asshole in this to you? Yeah, but she kind of does in the book, too, so... Uh, okay. Um, she didn't feel nearly like as much like an asshole um, in the show, though, you know, there were times I, I she got kind of cringy. Um, but, yeah, I think it was one of my other takeaways while reading this was, like, huh... She, you know, a lot of like the almost the entire uh, book is you're with her, and there's a lot of it, especially in the beginning when she's, you know, whining to Azriel about you know take Ricky take me to the show, and he's like no go, <laughs> go hide in the vents. Um, that and that that's another thing they don't spend a tremendous amount of time fleshing out who the villains are and why they have such an issue with Azriel at all. Or why this is important to cleave the demons from the children. They just sort of... It's it's maybe touched upon, and then they just speed right through it. Yeah, even the device that's designed to split the child from their demon, it barely gets any, you know, acknowledgement in the artwork. Right. This is a terrifying device that is, for, you know, to put it in the most basic of, cir- of circumstances... Designed to cut out your soul. (laughs) Right. Yeah. It really needed some more attention on it. You know, this is a device that I would have done, again, at least a half page 
just right. of Lyra looking at it and the fear of, oh my God, that thing is going to cut out my soul. Is it just me? Do they also skip the scene where Lyra ends up in the machine? No, the scene's in there. They just rush through it. Okay, well, yeah, okay. clearly it had absolutely no impact on me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there is some talent in the artwork here. But it, again, this feels like it was done in a complete rush job. Mm-hmm. And I am very disappointed in it because of that. Okay. Um, I think we've kind of covered it. Is there anything else you wanted to... I'm going to kind of kick it over to you. Is there anything else you want to discuss? Anything uh, you have on your agenda as far as this book goes? Yeah. Skip the graphic novel. Read the actual novel. <laughs> okay. Seriously. You know, the book... I mean, again... If you're just if you don't want to actually read the novel, I know there's some. I'm just gonna say this. I know there are some who have trouble getting through a whole actual novel, a whole book, and I get that. And if you're someone like that, and you prefer to read the graphic novel because it's easier for you, no judgment. But if you want to get a better understanding of it and really feel everything that Lyra and the characters are going through. I'd recommend just getting the real book. Okay. Uh, with that said, I think we're going to conclude our discussion. I think we've said all that needs to be said about this, since there isn't, you know, that much to it. Uh, so with that said, hey, what's going on in your world these days, huh? Seriously. <laughs> what are you working on? What are you? What? Uh, tell them what you're selling. What's going on in my world is because all the craft stores are closed, I have to actually order online just to get earring hooks and small bags to hold all my pieces when I could just run around the corner to the shop and just run in and grab them real quick. (laughs) Uh... I understand social distancing and closing the shops, and I am grateful that store owners are taking that seriously, but you have to admit it is a pain when you go, I could have just run in and gotten this in five minutes. Now I have to order it online. I understand. Listen, you know we can get food pretty regularly through Amazon, but you know we've had a couple of other things we've had to order. Like you know, my kids got good report cards, so I let them you know pick some toys to buy. And I just got a as we were doing this podcast, I got an announcement that says, "Yeah, the toy that you ordered will be here someday." I ordered a mask. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered a mask from work for work. Uh, it's, you know, just a regular medical mask, but it has the, the Bane face on it, you know, the, uh, the from The Dark Knight Rises. Nice. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, wait, which Bane mask? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, initially it was supposed to come, I think, last week, and then I keep getting messages going, eh, we'll get it to you someday. This may or may not be over by then. This is not a slam of delivery drivers and Amazon workers who are still working their butts off to provide for us. We are grateful every day for what you guys are doing. Please be safe. No, I, I get it. It's, it's absolutely about prioritizing. My kid's remote control car is not nearly as important as getting food to people or whatever other major things they might need. I agree. <laughs> but really, what pieces are you working on? Because you've always got some sort of project going on. Yeah, actually, I just finished up a new line of dangly earrings uh, made from Scrabble tiles. This is something new that I had originally put off because for a while I, my only Scrabble tile earrings were studs. But I've officially gotten bored enough and realized that I accidentally ordered the wrong size beads. So I had to figure out something to do with them. So I said, hey, let's incorporate them into new earrings. So I didn't just shoot myself in the foot and waste $50 of my, of my uh, stock on wrong size beads. <clears throat> and you're holding up okay otherwise over there in uh, <clears throat> Missouri? Yes, other than that, we're doing fine. The new earrings will be on our stores uh, later this week, provided that this uh, lovely weather does hold up. It's spring in the Midwest, so we're usually like, okay, flip a coin. It's going to either be rainy, sunny, or grab the dogs and run to the basement. So... Uh, Actually, I just realized I am overdue for you for have for a tornado drill because it, it was around this time last year <laughs> when we reviewed the Aladdin uh, reboot that I had to say, okay, guys, I'm gonna we're gonna be delayed because <laughs> I'm in the basement with Eddie and Toby. <laughs> um. So yes, uh, this is part one of our two part Alexis Hanna shows this week. Tomorrow we'll be doing a TV party for his dark his dark material season one. They have been greenlit 
for season two, which they will, I'm sure, cover the uh, the Amber Spyglass, presumably. I would imagine they're going to do all three books for three seasons, so uh, we'll keep with it for as long as HBO keeps doing it. And I then, think The Subtle Knife was the second one. Amber Spyglass, I think, was uh, this will be the third season. Yeah, I had it backwards. Um, yeah. And then later this week, Sean Comer and I will do an on trial for the uh, Nicole Kidman Golden Compass. Uh, next week... Next thir- uh, a week from Thursday, the seventh of May, myself and Alexis Tana will do comic stripped, and uh, I twisted her arm. <laughs> this was this was totally a snow job on my part, an absolute lobbying uh, effort. Uh, we are going to do comic stripped. I am not okay with this. We're going to talk about the book, and we're going to talk about the Netflix series. Won't that be a guess? I still need to order the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I reminded you. Um, <laughs> And then you get a break. Uh, no Alexis handled the following week. But the week after, you get uh, a double dose of her again. We'll do TV party for she- the final season of she on May 18th, she season 5. And then, if you've been missing the damn you Hollywood gang, well, we're going to get together for another VOD animated release. This time, and this time is where I got my arm twisted, uh, we'll be doing Scoob. So it'll be myself, Robert Winfrey, Alexis Aina, and we may or may not have a return of the prodigal. That's P-R-O-D, not P-R-O-T. <laughs> <laughs> Son. We're never going to let you forget that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm not even going to let myself forget it, because I know better than that. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll, so uh, Jason Teasley, who's actually the one that pitched this idea, will be doing a DMU Hollywood for the VOD release of... The animated feature, Scoob. And don't you want to hear Mark Wahlberg do the voice of the Blue Falcon? Sure. Um, and then finally, closing out May, uh, we'll do another live source material uh, with Alexis Haina. We're going to do book nine of the Don Rosa Uncle Scrooge series, I believe it, it is. Uh, it's the Three Caballeros Ride Again. <clears throat> it's either Uncle Scrooge or Donald Duck, one of the two. It's probably Donald Duck. Uh, according to the hardcover that I got here, it says Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck, the three caballeros ride again, the Don Rosa Library, Volume 9. Yes, we're going to do the entire ninth volume of that of, see, it was both, Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck, the three caballeros ride again, which is one of the stories in Volume 9. And then that Thursday, we're going to dip into Disney Plus, and we're going to do a series that was actually uh, broadcast in South America is now there for our watching pleasure the legend of the three caballeros for a tv party yeah, well we were yeah well the woody woodpecker live action movie got a wide release there at first so this was our way of saying sorry <laughs> and uh so yes if, you, if you're missing alexis Haina and you truly appreciate her the way i do you're gonna get a whole lot of her a whole lot of alexis Haina this may how about that well again i need something to do <laughs> All right, um, so with that said, thank you for joining us here on this live edition of Source Material. For the aforementioned Alexis Haina, be well, be safe, and behave. Wash your hands.